What's the power of knowing what you don't know? That's the central question behind the latest book from Adam Grant. It's called Think Again, and it's the first serious nonfiction book I've read in 2021. In this video, some of my favourite lessons from this excellent read from organisational psychology professor Adam Grant. To start off by saying I'm a big fan of Grant's work, his earlier book Originals had a big and quite profound impact on my thinking. I love the way that he uses accessible academic research to illustrate his ideas. Unlike quite a lot of other psychology authors, Grant has a fantastic style. It's incredibly accessible. Think Again is about building the skill set we need to rethink and unlearn in what is admittedly a turbulent and changing world. As we navigate life, we can broadly have one of two mindsets, fixed or growth. Having a fixed mindset assumes that our attributes, things like our character, intelligence, our creative ability, that these are static throughout our lives. On the other hand, having a growth mindset allows us to adapt and change as challenges arise. These different mindsets, these different approaches, they account for a great deal of our success or failure in life, and they're also a big driver of happiness. Having a growth mindset is far preferable to having a fixed mindset. Now, that's not directly what Think Again by Adam Grant covers, but it's why, as far as I'm concerned at least, this ability to question what we think, what we know, to think again, it's why this is so valuable. In Think Again, Grant introduces the concept of seizing and freezing in. This is what psychologists say happens when it comes to our knowledge and opinions. We have a natural preference for comfort of conviction over the discomfort of doubt. So we hold on tightly to our beliefs to what we think we know, because it's quite unsettling, it's quite uncomfortable to think again, to revise those thoughts. So the book is all about mental flexibility, about the value and importance of rethinking. One stat in the book that I found particularly fascinating is that back in 2011, we consumed about five times as much information each day as we did 25 years earlier. Technological advances are generating significantly more information and that has a profound effect on our thinking. But despite this surge in information being generated, which seems to be growing at a rather exponential rate, it takes time for the education system to catch up. Grant says, in education, after revelations in history and revolutions in science, it often takes years for a curriculum to be updated and textbooks to be revised. This point especially resonated with me because we've recently made the decision in respect of my eldest daughter for her to leave school and adopt a programme of unschooling. I'm a huge fan of the UK education system, but I believe for some children there is a better way of doing things. The current curriculum, while it's improved a great deal in recent years, doesn't necessarily take into consideration all of the advances that we're seeing in technology, in science, in society. There are still structural issues around the UK education system which hark back to Victorian times, preparing children for a rather archaic career path certainly not reflective of what they're likely to experience when they leave school in the future. In Think Again, Grant talks about a couple of biases that drive a pattern in human behaviour. One is called confirmation bias, and that's seeing what we expect to see. And the other is called desirability bias, which is seeing what we want to see. Increasingly in the world of personal financial planning, we're focusing to a much larger extent on these sorts of biases. It's becoming the case that coaching and managing human behaviour is just as important as making the right investment recommendations. We can make fantastic investment recommendations for our clients, but if human emotions and psychology prevent them from sticking to that plan, if behavioural biases mean that they react poorly to short-term market movements, for example, then that fantastic set of investment recommendations has quite little value. There's a brilliant piece of analysis in the book about the difference between men and women. I've no doubt this is something that we're all probably familiar with already, but to see it in black and white and on the basis of academic studies is important. Grant said that in a meta-analysis of 95 studies involving over 100,000 people, women typically underestimated their leadership skills, while men overestimated their skills. So simply being male male or female can put you in a difficult position when it comes to your confidence about your existing skills. Think Again looks at the Dunning-Kruger effect. That's when, when we lack competence, we're most likely to be overconfident. Dunning-Kruger is a psychological concept that I've come across before via my work with a human factors training consultant. And again, it's a psychological concept that seems to be gaining popularity in the financial planning space at the moment. We see it to some extent with the retirement planning stage of financial planning. Studies have shown as people 
people get older, their financial capability reduces with their age, but their levels of confidence in this financial capability maintain about the same level. And this can be incredibly dangerous, believing that we have the same level of capability, having confidence we have the same level of financial capability. But that capability is actually slipping away over time. That can lead to making some very poor decisions. Grant also points out that the less intelligent we are in a particular domain, the more we seem to overestimate our actual intelligence in that area. And I think this is something that we've seen in recent weeks in the world of investing, with this huge growth in amateur retail investors taking to social media, sharing tips and personal experience around day trading strategies. It's clear that there is an absence of skill, intelligence, qualifications behind much of what's being said in many of these videos. But there's an awful lot of overestimation of intelligence in that particular area. How do we protect ourselves from this Dunning-Kruger effect? Well, apparently the trick is uncertainty. Because uncertainty when it comes to any particular domain prompts us to ask questions and then absorb new ideas. I'm sure there's a balance to be struck here though because we don't want to be so uncertain that we feel unable to make decisions or take action. But we don't want to be so certain that we rush in and overestimate our competence. Grant says the goal is not to be wrong more often. It's to recognise that we're all wrong more often than we would like to admit. And the more we deny it, the deeper the hole we declare ourselves. I find this psychology stuff absolutely fascinating. In Think Again, Grant talks about the amygdala. That's the part of our brain which triggers the fight or flight response. And according to research, when our core beliefs, when what we hold dearly. When these are challenged, that can trigger that part of our brain, our lizard brain. So we skip straight past the rational thinking that we need in that circumstance. We go straight into fight or flight. Grant has a lovely phrase in this book. He says it feels like we've been punched in the mind. So when somebody challenges our core beliefs, it feels like someone's actually slammed us in our head, in our brains with their fist. Why do we hold on so tightly to these core beliefs that we have? Why do we find it so difficult to think again? Grant explains that when we hold the wrong opinions, these are often shielded in filter bubbles. So we go out looking for information that supports our existing beliefs, our convictions. And with our beliefs shielded in filter bubbles, they're then sealed inside of echo chambers. That's where we hear just from the people who intensify our beliefs and validate them as well. We see this so much on social media, don't we? We gravitate towards people who hold similar opinions, similar beliefs to our own. And that is incredibly dangerous because it can reinforce the wrong thinking. Going back to the earlier point, we don't like our beliefs to be challenged because it feels like a personal attack. It feels like somebody is punching us in that part of our brain. In Think Again, Grant shares an example of successful forecasters. And this is a topic I've enjoyed reading about before in the book Super Forecasters by Philip Tetlock, who I think is one of Grant's colleagues at, uh, at Wharton. Uh, Grant explains that the single most important driver of forecaster success was how often they updated their beliefs. So if you're trying to forecast the future and make a semi-accurate prediction about what's likely to happen next, then the worst possible thing you can do is hold on tightly to your forecast tightly to your expectation. If you're able to update your forecast and update what you believe are the drivers behind your forecast and go through what Grant calls rethinking cycles, then you're more likely to discover new information that leads to you revising your predictions, helping you to keep them more accurate. There's this lovely line in the book where Grant says that psychologists find that admitting we were wrong doesn't make us look less competent. It's a display of honesty and a willingness to learn. I think sometimes we're unwilling to change our opinions, to change our worldview because it will somehow make us look weak or incompetent to others. Even though that willingness to consider new information, to change our stance on the subject, is actually quite an attractive quality. One tool we can use to overcome these issues is to recruit a team of people who are constructively critical of what we do. In Grant's case, when he writes a book, he gets together a group of his most thoughtful critics and he asks them to tear each chapter apart. Now, in building this so-called challenge network, he says he looks for disagreeable people who are givers, not takers. There's also some fantastic stuff in the book about how to change somebody else's mind. And I'm sure during this pandemic, we've come across plenty of people who hold fairly outrageous ideas, whether that's a conspiracy theory to do with the vaccination program, or perhaps why governments are motivated to lock down society. Grant suggests a strategy called motivational interviewing and says the most effective way to help others open their minds is often to listen. That's despite our first instinct, which is to start talking. And motivational interviewing uses different types of talk to help change somebody's mind to convince them to think again. He makes the distinction in the book between sustained talk, which is commentary about maintaining the status quo, and change talk, which is referencing a desire, ability, need or commitment to make adjustments. Now, according to Grant, it's change talk, which
which is the golden thread to helping somebody think again. Grant gives a useful warning in the book about charismatic speakers. And I think this one's particularly relevant when it comes to the world of personal finance, when it comes to investing, because we often see these individuals who are incredibly charismatic, who come across as polished and well presented. But really, what you need to look at is look beyond the appearance to the message they're sharing, and also the motivation behind that message. Grant says that charismatic speakers can put us under a political spell under which we follow them to gain their approval or affiliate with their tribe. We should be persuaded by the substance of an argument, not the shiny package in which it's wrapped. And I think that's fantastic advice. It's often you know, something I've said in my previous videos. You have to look beyond the packaging. Don't judge a book by its cover, judge it by its content. There's some fantastic stuff in Think Again about why we make mistakes. And Grant introduces a concept called psychological safety. He uses this example of the Challenger launch and disaster and why psychological safety was a persistent problem at NASA. If people in a group feel unsafe psychologically, they're less likely to flag up the problems they've identified. He says some engineers did raise red flags ahead of the Challenger launch, but they were silenced by managers and others were simply ignored and they ended up silencing themselves. They didn't feel psychologically safe. There's also some great stuff in the book about happiness, which, as you know, is one of the drivers behind making the uh, videos on this channel. Uh, I hope I make these videos to help improve your levels of happiness. Grant explains that the Kingdom of Bhutan has a gross national happiness index. And I think that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Because we're so used to measuring economic performance by way of gross domestic products or GDP, when actually something that's probably far more important to all of us, far more relevant to our day-to-day -day lives, is how happy we are. However, Grant warns that psychologists have found that the more people value happiness, the less happy they often become with their lives, which seems like quite an odd thing, doesn't it? If you value happiness highly, you're also more likely to become unhappy. And he says there's even evidence that placing a great deal of importance on happiness is a risk factor for depression. This study of happiness is something that I need to dive into to a much greater extent and read a lot more about. So if you have any book recommendations, do let me know. I would definitely recommend you pick up Think Again by Adam Grant. It finishes with a very useful summary, his top 30 practical takeaways. And I won't spoil it by going through those, but just to share a few of those tips, for example, seeking out information that goes against your core beliefs, embracing the joy of being wrong when you've made a mistake and building a challenge network not just a support network he also talks about having conversations about the conversation all too often particularly with the advent of social media we see people playing the man not the ball debate is so much more constructive and so much more positive when it's about the conversation and not about the person having the conversation so i think that's a really important tip we can pick up too if you've read think again by adam grant i'd love to hear from you tell me what your key takeaways were from this book i hope that's short book review was helpful and interesting the next book the book i'm currently reading is called green lights by matthew mcconaughey and then i've noticed loads of fantastic looking books that are being published in the coming months including a world without email by cal newport the art of impossible by stephen kotler and noise by daniel kahneman please do press that subscribe button please like this video as well pressing the like button really does help with the youtube algorithm and it's because youtube then shows our videos to more people that helps to grow our audience even bigger my 12 year old nephew has sent me the challenge of reaching 2,000 subscribers by the end of this month. And I've got a lot more work to do to get there to meet Barnaby's challenge. So perhaps you can help me out by pressing the subscribe button too. Thank you for watching this video. Until next time, I'm Martin Bamford. And remember, when it comes to your money, the more you know, the faster it can grow.